preliminary lecture for the vestibular system. We will primarily talk about the peripheral sensory apparatus, um, the, some of the specializations that are peculiar to the vestibular system, and this lecture should give you a quick and brief introduction to, um, to the sensory system, and um, we, we, can, we can discuss this in better detail in the in-class session. Okay, so let's start with where the vestibular system is located. Uh, the vestibular system is a part of the inner ear, which you've already been introduced to, at least the auditory portion of the inner ear. This here is a, is a nice um, diagram or, or um, image uh, representing the bony cavity of the inner ear. So the inner ear is, is a hollow labyrinthine cavity contained within the petrous bone of the temporal bone. And it's filled with uh, several layers of um, uh, membranes that contain fluids and sensory epithelia. This image is really supposed to represent the outer or bony shell of the inner ear. This is the stapes, which you should have seen in your introduction to the auditory system, which in fact drives the cochlea. The vestibular system gets its name from the fact that most people envisioned it as simply the entrance to the cochlea or the vestibule. Only later did they realize that in fact the structure was much more complicated and formed this nice three-dimensional uh, orthogonal uh, structure. In the next slides, I'll show you what these structures are and what they mean for sensory perception. It's composed of three canals or semicircular canals. And they're just fluid-filled tubes. Here's one. It's called the uh, anterior semicircular canal the posterior semicircular canal, and the horizontal sem or lateral semicircular canal. And we'll look at the details of this structure in subsequent slides. Okay, so this is a nice animation showing the location of the ear canal, uh, inner ear structure within the head. And also we'll give you a nice view a perspective of the three-dimensional structure. So here's the ear, inner ear labyrinth from one side of the ear uh, of the head. Note the three-dimensional structure. Here's the entrance to the vis vestibule. Okay. Here are the three canals. And as you can see, as I rotate through this animation, the three canals form uh, uh, arch through different planes of axis. Here's the horizontal canal, which is basically in this axis. This is the anterior canal, which basically is forming this axis. And this is the posterior canal forming this axis. If we peel away the bony layers of the labyrinth, you'd reveal the membranous or soft tissue structures. Remember that these structures are all filled with fluid. This structure here, to reorient you, is the cochlea, the sensory organ for the auditory system. It's innervated by the auditory nerve. Running parallel to the auditory nerve is the primary vestibular nerve. This nerve has two branches, the superior and the inferior branch, and each of these branches further branches to make contact with five different sensory epithelia. The epithelia are contained within individual swellings. The first two are called the utriculus and the sacculus. The utriculus and the sacculus are responsible for encoding or sensing linear accelerations. Other branches of the nerve go to the ampullae 
of the semicircular canals. The ampullae are these swellings that form between the canal and the utricle. And there are three such swellings forming at the borders of each of the semicircular canals. Okay, so what does the vestibular system do? Well, most of us are usually not aware of what the vestibular system is doing because it's an inconspicuous sense. You're not really conscious of it unless something goes wrong. And things can go wrong. For example, those of you who might have experienced motion sickness or dizziness or vertigo, those are all um, uh, a result of aberrant or mismatched signals from the vestibular system. So first, it's an inconspicuous or unconscious sixth sense. The sense or the sensory system's main function is to drive reflexes. The primary reflex or the most um, uh, commonly thought of reflex is called the vestibular ocular reflex in which the vestibular system sends information about head position and accelerations in order to then drive movements of the eye and such movements allow you to stabilize your gaze. As an example, try this. Hold a finger up in front of your face and move it really fast or fast. And what you see is that your image of your finger should be fairly blurred. Now do the opposite. Keep your finger still and move your head and focus on the finger. If your vestibular system is working well, then you have been able to focus your gaze on your finger. But this is the power of the vestibular system in allowing you to use information about the position and movement and acceleration of your head to then send signals to your eye to compensate for those motions. In addition to driving the vestibular ocular reflex, the vestibular system also sends signals and drives reflexes to the neck and to the body. And these re uh, signals help you to maintain your posture and balance. Next, before we talk about the nitty gritties and the details of how the vestibular system um, uh, performs its function, let's establish a few common um, uh, establish common nomenclature and um, modalities and qualities of uh, spatial orientation. Okay, so usually we imagine that there are three modalities of spatial orientation. These include angular rotation, which we've been already talking about, linear acceleration, which most of you would understand what linear acceleration is if you've sat in a car, and then tilt relative to gravity. I'll actually take some time to define each of these parameters in a little bit better detail because the, the coordinate system and the modality that um, we understand the system to be detecting turns out to be important in, in making sure we don't confuse ourselves when we're talking about, uh, about the sense. And again, in addition to the three modalities, each of these has two qualities that the system has to encode, and these include direction and amplitude. So hopefully during your dis our discussion today and in the in-class session, we should think about how the system is able to encode both of these features or qualities. Okay, so let's start with establishing a common um, coordinate system. So because the relevant parameter here is for the sensory system to sense, detect, and encode the position of our head relative to the body, the, the natural coordinate system is also defined relative to the head. So in this sense, a uh, simple Cartesian coordinate system, uh -oh. What happens in PowerPoint? Okay, a simple Cartesian system where X is defined as the direction directly in front of your nose, Y towards your left ear, 
and Z towards the top of your head. And gravity, of course, is always pointing down. Now this coordinate system, X, Y, and Z, is independent of the direction of gravity and is entirely based on the position of your head. So for example, if I was to lie down on my side, um, the coordinate system is still de defined by the direction of my nose, my left ear, and the top of my head. Okay, okay so then um, first modality was angular rotation. And there are three directions of angular rotation. The first is a rotation around the x-axis, so around the nose, in this way. That's my head. That's also shown in figure A. And this is commonly referred to as roll and is encoded by the superior canal. You have another opportunity to look at the different canals to convince yourself that the superior canal is within the plane of the roll axis. Pitch is a rotation around the y-axis and is encoded by the posterior canal. And yaw is in the direction or is a rotation around the z-axis and is encoded by the lateral canal. Now again, remember that these definitions and the, uh, the structure that encodes each of these rotations is independent of the direction of gravity. Okay, Much like angular rotation, there are also three directions for linear translation. Again, the x direction, the y direction, and the z directions up and down. And again, here I've shown gravity pointing down, but this coordinate system is independent of gravity. Okay, well, the vestibular system is actually important for also sensing position relative to gravity. And we refer to that sense or modality as tilt. And tilt is usually a slow or static quantity relative to gravity. So there's pitch tilt and roll tilt. Of course, the yaw tilt doesn't apply. Okay. So in the next few slides, I'd like to show you how the sensory system detects angular rotations. So again, these are the three directions of angular rotation. These three directions are basically encoded by the three semicircular canals. The horizontal semi or uh, semicircular canal, also known as the lateral semicircular canal, is in the plane of rotation for yaw. The posterior semicircular canal is in the plane of axis for pitch, and the anterior semicircular canal is in the plane of axis for, for roll. And as I'll show you in a couple of slides and in a small animation, it is the movement of these fluids and the acceleration of these fluids and the deflection of a mechanical sensor that is responsible for encoding movements of the head. Each of the ampullae contains a sensory epithelium and the sensory epithelium is called the crista of the ampulla or the crista ampullaris. And this is what it looks like. Here's a schematic representing the ampulla. Here are the nerve fibers coming into the ampulla. And here is the epithelium. You're looking at a cross-sectional view of the epithelium. The epithelium might look something like this. Embedded within the epithelium are the sensory cells. These are actually hair cells, much like the hair cells that are responsible for encoding auditory information. They're a mechano trans transducer. The hair cells are embedded in a gelatinous structure called the cupula. And this entire structure is surrounded by endolymph, much like the hair cells were bathed by endolymph in the auditory system.
The cilia of the hair cell, the stereocilia of the hair cells, are embedded within this gelatinous structure. So as you rotate your head, the fluids, the endolymph, moves within this structure. As, the, as you change directions and the, um, and the uh, head experiences a change in angular acceleration, the inertia uh, deflects this, the, this large gelatinous cupulary structure. And that cupula's deflection also deflects the bundles. We'll look at this structure in better detail as um, in subsequent slides, but before we do that, I'd like to show you a small animation to demonstrate the movement of this cupula in response to the mo motions of these fluids. Motions of the fluids are actually quite important, so watch the animation carefully. Okay, so here's the animation. Here's just a quick figure again. The bony labyrinth the en and the endolymphatic sac within the bony labyrinth. Okay. Take note that this endolymphatic fluid sac is actually contiguous with the endolymphatic um, chamber of the cochlea. So these are really one continuous structure. Okay, so here are the ampullae, the swelling, and here is a demonstration or a schematic of one of, of the cupulary structure within the ampulla. So you basically the cupula is bathed in endolymph and it's this gelatinous structure. As the fluids are moving in the endolymph, this cupula deflects back and forth, right? Like that. Embedded within the cupula are a set of mechanotransducing cells called the hair cells. You've seen these before in the auditory system. And remember, they're called hair cells because they basically have these ciliary-like structures. They're not true cilia, but cilia-like structures that are projecting into the, uh, into the cupula. Now, in the cochlea, the hair cells, um, the ones that are primarily uh, talking to the afferent neuron, are freestanding in fluid. In this case, in all of the vestibular epithelia that we'll talk about today, they're uh, largely embedded in some sort of a gelatinous structure. Uh, in this case, the cupula. Okay. Okay. Now here's where the animation begins to show you how the fluids are moving. So make note of this this figure here, which is supposed to represent uh, a head. It looks like a head, so it's a head, and um, the head's going to be moving. Okay, back and forth, up and down, and you're supposed to be watching how the fluids are moving in and out of these canals or through these canals and how they might be stimulating the cupula. These three green balls are inserted into this space to uh, represent the motion of the fluid so that you can, uh, to give you a little contrast so you can visualize it. Okay, so I'm gonna hit play to the an animation and you should watch how these um, beads are moving as the head is moving. There it goes. Okay, pitch. This is the horizontal canal during yaw. Oh. You can see how the cupula is moving. This is for pitch, 
Note how there's, there's a lag between the movement of the fluid and the movement of the head. Now that we've had a chance to look at the fluid motions, um, let's take a moment to review the stereociliary bundles of the hair cells. These are the real stars of, of um, mechanotransduction in this case. So much like the auditory hair cells and the hair bundles that you saw in the auditory system, those are shown here in C, where they have this stacked set of bundles that are stacked and linked together. You can see these individual bundles, yeah? And these is this, in this case, this auditory cell has multiple rows. The vestibular hair cells have hair bundles as well, and these are also stereocellular bundles that are stacked in a, in a graded fashion based on height. Now, vestibular bundles are uh, peculiar in that they actually also have um, a true cilium in addition to these stereocilia. And you can see the true cilium is over here, and it's often the tallest of the bundle. Um, in this case, um, stereocilia are in many ways similar to auditory stereocilia, and the, and the mechanotransduction mechanism of these cilia are also thought to be very similar. Now all of these bundles are usually linked and moved together as a rigid structure. They have, in addition to uh, the mechanotransducing um, tip link, which I'll show, which uh, is is illustrated as a schematic here, the bundles also have several side and lateral links that allow this entire structure to move as one rigid bundle. Now. Um, between adjacent bundles, as you go down the, the stairway, there's this um, tip link or mechanotransducing um, gating channel. Now the idea is usually that this is some sort of a stretch activated channel that when deflected in uh, one direction, usually towards the tallest of the bundles, the, um, there's an ion channel that opens due to a stretch activate or an activation that's dependent on this stretch. And when that ion channel opens, it allows potassium primarily to flow through this ion channel and depolarize the hair cell. Okay, so if you deflect the bundle in the opposite direction, this, um, this stretch decreases and the ion channel closes creating a hyperpolarization of the cell. So the important point to remember is that the structure and the gating mechanism of this transduction channel has, gives the cell a preferred direction of excitation. In one direction, you depolarize the cell. In the other direction, you hyperpolarize the cell. So what's the consequence of that? If you remember in the auditory system, Right? When you depolarize the cell, um, the depolarization triggers a calcium, a voltage dependent calcium channel, which then triggers a cascade of reactions that allows the uh, um, uh, glutamate contain containing vesicles to fuse with the membrane, allowing them to spill glutamate into the synaptic cleft, which is then received by the afferent neuron and uh, uh, signals the transmit the, the uh, uh, signaling to the brainstem. Okay, and in fact, that's a very similar mechanism by which the vestibular system works. So in this schematic, we're actually representing what an auditory neuron would do. If you remember, for an auditory neuron, when you deflect the bundles at different rates, the 
hair cell can only keep, follow the fine details, uh, temporal details of the deflection to up to about 2000 hertz. And the capacitance and um, um, leak of the, of the uh, basolateral membrane um, determines the, the time course over which the, the hair cell can follow the fine, fine detail, temporal details of the deflection. Now for the auditory system, this limitation had some serious consequences in terms of how, uh, in terms of how neurons phase lock to uh, different frequencies. And that in turn had a consequence for the types of information that can be used for localizing sounds of different frequencies. Now the vestibular system is very different in its constraints. Unlike the auditory system, which works at extremely high frequencies in relative to the vestibular system, the vestibular system usually works somewhere between 0.2 and at the very, very, very high end, 20 hertz. Now that's very different than 20 to 20,000 hertz, like as in the auditory system. Okay. So the vestibular system actually has a really interesting and peculiar anatomy in terms of its hair cells. It has one of the most um, special, most interesting specializations in terms of the diversity in hair, hair cells and afferent terminals. Here's an image of, um, of a vestibular epithelium and we've outlined two example hair cells. Here's one hair cell, it's relatively um, cylindrical in shape and here's a neuron that's making a terminal uh, that's terminating on this uh, hair cell and it actually makes a fairly small button or bouton type terminal on this hair cell. In contrast here's a hair cell right next to it that has this lovely flask shape and surrounding this hair cell is its afferent terminal which almost completely cups and envelops the basal pole of the hair cell. And in fact, this enveloping of the hair cell turns out to give this hair cell this uh, pinched neck that makes it look like a flask or a calyx. And that's where this uh, afferent terminal derives its name. It's called a calyx terminal. So the membrane properties and the types of bundles that are found atop of these cells are very different. And this is a specialization of the vestibular system. This calyx afferent is the only postsynaptic afferent that we know of, and we don't really know what it does. We simply know that the epithelium expresses and has these specializations. Now, hair cells in the auditory system and in the vestibular system have a very interesting synaptic structure. In fact, they share um, this specialization with the vestibular, uh, with the with the retina. This vesicular structure is called a ribbon synapse, and the ribbon synapse can come in multiple shapes. Here, it's a long rod-like ribbon, or a, a dense proteinaceous structure, with several vesicles tethered to the ribbon. You can see the here they're tethered in this uh, arrangement here and in a little circular arrangement here. And here is a postsynaptic density opposing the ribbon at the uh, interface between the hair cell and the neuron. Now these synaptic ribbons, much like in the auditory system, are very important for um, allowing the neuro, uh, hair cell to communicate both sudden and transient changes in input as well as to encode sustained, um, uh, sustained stimuli or tonic stimuli. Okay, but in general, uh, whether it's a type 1 hair cell that forms a calyx, uh, that for, uh, uh, provides input to a calyx terminal or a lar one of those large fully encasing terminals or to these small bouton terminals, both types of hair cells provide a generally similar response. And the generally similar response is illustrated here. 
when the hair cell is in some resting state, there is a uh, resting discharge or a spontaneous discharge. And as I'll show you in future slides, um, in the vestibular system, this rest and discharge can be tremendously high at as much as 100 spikes per second, which is actually a very high spontaneous discharge rate. And when the bundles are deflected towards the tallest stereocilia, the hair cell depolarizes and there's an increased firing uh, at, in, the, in the nerve terminal. So this is an excitation. When the uh, hair cell comes back to the, de the deflection comes back to its resting condition, you come back to your resting discharge rate. When you deflect the bundle in the opposite direction, you hyperpolarize the cell, and there's a decrease or inhibition in the firing rate. So already here you can see that having a high spontaneous discharge rate has an advantage in terms of being able to signal the cell both in the depolarization direction as an excitation and as an inhibition. Okay, so how does this work in the context of angular rotation and um, sensing angular accelerations? Here is the schematic of two semicircular canals on opposing sides of the head. So remember again, here's the ampulla, this is the cupula, here's a hair cell with the bundle embedded in the um, cupula and the uh, uh, afferent nerves um, uh, that are being signaled. Okay, so if you move your head in one direction, now let's say this was the lateral canal and I'm moving my head to the right, um, the, the inertia will actually have the fluids move to the left. Yes? in both canals. In the canal on the left, the fluid motion um, and in, uh, deflects the cupula towards the inhibitory direction. So there is a decrease in the action, rate of action potentials. On the right side, the cupula is deflected towards the excitatory direction. Remember, the fluids are moving in the same direction in both canals. Since the, flu the cupula moves in the excitatory direction, there is an increase in the firing rate. So on one side of the head, there is an increase in the firing rate, and on the other side of the head, there is a decrease in the firing rate. And so there is a pull and push mechanism, a contrast in the, type, in the excitation from on either side of the head that, can, that eventually signals um, the brainstem. Okay, so here's a, 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 a data set from the canal afferents of a squirrel monkey. In the experiment, the um, head experienced an acceleration, a, then a constant velocity, and a deceleration. And this was the response of the afferent neuron. It had a fairly um, vigorous spontaneous discharge rate of about uh, I don't know, 80, 80 spikes per second. During the initial acceleration, there was an increase in the firing rate. Once you hit constant velocity, the firing rate started to adapt. Then finally, when there was a deceleration, there was an inhibi inhibitory response and the firing rate was inhibited and again um, uh, uh, recovered. So let's finish up with this slide. Um, so in summary, this neuron really is only responding to changes in velocity, so to rotational or angular accelerations. Right? So what does this mean in terms of its frequency response? How does the, um, are there, does this pose some sort of constraint on these neurons' ability to encode angular rotation or the frequency of angular rotation? And in fact, it does. This is a schematic or a diagram showing the uh, response of these canal afferents um, to frequencies ranging from 1 to 0 0.01 hertz.
and on the y-axis you're looking at the normalized response of the canal afferent. Okay, remember again that this is sinusoidal rotation, so you're looking at the um, um, uh, modulation peak of the rate. So as you can see from this diagram, there is a frequency limit to how well these canal afferents can encode rotations. And that frequency limit is, sh is shown by the fall off of the normalized response of the canal afferent. So if we go back to the previous slide, we can kind of interpret this in uh, an intuitive way. So in this diagram, you can see, in fact, that when you're at a constant velocity, which in the extreme is a very low frequency change in velocity or a very low frequency uh, acceleration, the neuron's really not responding. And it's really responding to changes in acceleration or in velocity. And this is really showing the exact same thing. Okay, so here I want to show you a fun little video that demonstrates what happens when you um, when the vestibular system is sending conflicting information? So here we have a, a subject who was um, who's wearing a headset from which you can deliver current across the skin to stimulate the vestibular system on one or the other side. Okay, and in order to reduce visual input uh, that could provide um, guidance as to position, the subject is wearing these special glasses that um, that reverse, that uh, they're reverse prism glasses, which basically uh, remove the visual input. Okay? So here we go. So here she's asked to walk straight, and here's this guy holding a remote control, and using this joystick, he can excite one or the other side. So he's delivering current to either one side or the other side of the head. And as you can see, the, the, although the subject was instructed to walk in a straight line, she's unable to do it. Okay? So that's the end of that demonstration. But you can see that get, receiving conflicting information from the vestibular system on both sides can really impair your ability to walk the line. And in fact, you know, the, uh, many of the tests that look at sobriety are related to testing the function of the vestibular system. And we can talk in class, we can perhaps talk about what alcohol, why alcohol might impair your vestibular function. Okay, so let's talk about how the vestibular system codes linear acceleration and tilt. Remember again that the directions for linear acceleration are relative to the nose, the ear, and the top of your head. And static tilt is the position of your head relative to gravity. The two structures that are responsible for encoding linear translation and gravity are called the otolith organs, and there are two of them. They're the utric utricle and the saccule. And the sensory epithelium within each of these are called the macula, the, so the utricular macula and the saccular macula. So this is the epithelium that contains the hair cells. If you're standing upright, the hair cells of the utricle, or the hair bundles of the utricle, are pointing upwards. So movements that deflect the bundle will be anything that's uh, away from upwards. The saccule, on the other hand, is pointed this way, and the hair bundles are, or this way, let's say, and the hair bundles are pointed horizontally. Okay, so the saccule senses linear accelerations in Z and gravity, or changes in gravity. Of course, these two structures roughly form an orthogonal uh, plane, so any, um, any, any linear changes in linear accelerations can be encoded by a combination of the, these two structures. 
But each of the structures, although they're roughly orthogonal, they do have a little bit of curvature, giving them a more comp a, the ability to encode a slightly more complex dimensionality. So, for example, the utricle can sense a little bit of gravity because it cur curves up a little and some of the hair cells are pointed horizontally. So there is one key difference between the, well, there are several differences, but in terms of uh, the directionality of the hair bundles, um, unlike the canal organs or the hair cells in the canal organs, the utricular structure and the saccular structure have hair, hair cells whose bundles are pointed in both directions. By this I mean that on one half of the structure, all the hair cells have bundles that are pointing in one direction. And on another side of the same, same utricle, the hair bundles are pointing in the opposite direction. So this means that um, when half of, the, or half of the epithelium is excited, the other half of the epithelium is inhibited. Now this is very different from the canal or the afferents because when one side of the epithelium, when one uh, canal was excited, all the afferents in that side of the canal were excited and all the afferents in the canals on the opposite side of the head were inhibited. So the push and pull mechanism was really across uh, different sides of the head. Here you can get the push and pull um, excitation and inhibition on the same side of the head. Okay. So here is a more detailed um, um, image of the utricular macula from a mouse. Um, here in the in panel B in this colorful image are um, uh, is a is a, a confocal image from um, uh, the mouse utricle and you can nicely see the stereociliary hair bundles on many of these different cells. And you can see how actually these bundles are really long and somewhat floppy. So in yellow is the stereociliary bundle. And these, uh, as you, can, you might remember from where, when we discussed bundles in better detail a few slides back, these bundles also have what's called a kinocilium or a trucilium. Uh, the auditory system does not have a kinocilium after, um, uh, after early development. Okay, so in this figure here, they've actually looked at the directionality of individual bundles and have characterized that throughout the, um, throughout the, uh, the macula. So here, the, uh, you can see again the yellow staining for the stereociliary bundles and the little red dot um, is for the kinocilium. So the direction of preferred excitation is towards the kinocilium. And this line that defines where the bundles change their direction is referred to as the line of polarity reversal. You can see that it's not actually a nice straight line, you know, it kind of traverses a, a, a complicated path. And in, on top of that, you can see that it actually is, is a curved path. So it's not just a, you know, a, a straight line through the middle of, um, of the macula, meaning that there's a, there's a bit of a dimensionality and subtlety to, to the way in which any one utricle might encode um, linear accelerations in, in, um, the, in its plane of axis. Okay. There's another reason why the line of polarity reversal is actually quite important. Um, this figure doesn't show it as nicely, but in fact, if you were to be looking at this uh, epithelium from up top, you would see that there are actually fewer hair cells right about the line of polarity reversal. And this kind of uh, 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 sense that there is this stripe of low density uh, near the line of polarity reversal is a consequence of many things, and I'll show you what, a, a, what those things are in the next slide. And although here we're looking at the utricle, and in the next slide we're going to be looking at the saccule, the story is, is similar in both cases. Okay, so here is a schematic drawing of the saccule. And um, 
the, uh, this is the first time you've actually seen the multiple layers of the utricular macula, so I'll take some time to walk you through this. Now remember uh, what, what I said a couple of slides ago, that these, these structures are co called the otolith organs, these, the, the two together are called the otolith organs. And that name is derived from a early observation when you, that when you look into the, the two structures uh, before you've actually peeled it all apart, the most prominent feature is that they're filled with what look to be little stones. And in fact, they are. They're little carp calcium carbonate crystals. And that's how they derived their name because they looked like little ears with stones or ear stones. Okay, so otolith. Okay, so that's the first and most visible layer of the otolith organ is this, this layer of calcium, carbon, car uh, calcium carbonate crystals that are laying on top of a gelatinous membrane. Under the gelatinous membrane are the bun stereociliary bundles of the hair cells. Okay, and those hair cells are making contact with calyx and bouton afferents. So the way in which the hair bundles are really receiving their excitation is when you tilt your head to any one direction, the, the, um, the, the otoliths, the calcium carbonate crystals, and the gel layer all deflect in that direction and deflect the hair bundles. Okay, so about the, about the line of polarity reversal, when the crystals fall to this side, all of these hair cells are excited. And when the crystals fall to the other side, all of these hair cells are excited. Well, the mechanics of how this structure excites these hair cells seems to be slightly different de depending on the different regions of the epithelium. If you look at this center or stripe zone, or highlighted in blue, there are lots of very interesting specializations. For example, the very middle, the crystals in that stripe zone tend to be really small and fine. The gel layer also tends to be slightly more porous. And the bundles of the hair cells tend to be very short and stiff. Whereas hair cells and hair, bu hair bundles in the, uh, in the zones that are away from the stripe or in the extrastriolar zones tend to be really tall and floppy. The membrane tends to be thick on top of them and the crystals tend to be large. When early, in early experiments, when they recorded from the neurons, from the, from the vestibular neuron and, and labeled the individual afferents after recording, what they found was that neurons that are receiving information from hair cells in the striolar zone tend to have really irregular spontaneous discharge. So this is an example of uh, uh, one of these neurons um, that's just firing spontaneously in, in the absence of any um, uh, intended stimulation. And you can see that the timing between the spikes is really irregular. So you have really short intervals and very long intervals. In contrast, the neurons that seem to be receiving information from the extrastriolar zones tended to have really regular spike intervals. And in fact, this regularity of the spike intervals is a hallmark characteristic of vestibular afferents. In subsequent studies, when they labeled and, and characterized the terminals of these um, irregular and regular afferents, they found that most of the irregular afferents that seemed to be coming from, uh, from the central zones or the striolar zones of the epithelium were forming these large complex calyx type terminals with type 1 hair cells that had short bundles. Another proportion of the neurons, about 10 to 20 percent, had these highly regular firing patterns and they were coming from the far extra striolar regions 
and they were actually receiving input from large numbers of hair cells, up to 100 hair cells, using these small Bhutan-type terminals. A remaining mystery is really what the vast majority of neurons look like. In the vestibular system, it looks like more than 60 to 80 percent of the neurons have what's called a dimorphic uh, projection pattern in that they form both these intricate calyces and these um, uh, bouton type terminals. So there's a lot of effort dedicated to trying to understand what, uh, what allows neurons to, uh, what, what, uh, what features of these hair cells and neurons uh, allow them to um, fire with different temporal patterns. And the reason we're interested in that is that there are models that suggest that neurons that are firing with highly regular patterns encode information in a very different way than neurons that fire uh, with very irregular patterns. And these two figures illustrate what that kind of difference might be. Here is an irregular neuron that's in this dashed line, and this is a regular neuron, in which there, this is actually from a canal afferent, so these, these ideas are, are, are um, they also transcend to the canal afferents and their response. So the notion is that these irregular afferents tend to encode their information in terms of average, average rate, or spikes per second. Whereas the regular afferents are able to encode their information more in, in terms of the temporal, temporal details of the stimulus, and that the information that is contained within the temporal pattern can be used to nicely reconstruct the waveform of the stimulus, initial stimulus. So, but the message being that this, we don't really know if this is what's happening, but that there are these beautiful uh, distinction, uh, specializations within the epithelium, um, and perhaps these specializations are somehow intended to uh, represent the uh, sensory information in different ways, perhaps in one set using average rate and the other set using more of a temporal code. We started this lecture by talking about the function of the vestibular system and that it uses, its, its primary function is to provide uh, information about the position of your head so that it can drive some very important reflexes. The first of these reflexes is the vestibular ocular reflex, which is primarily designed to stabilize your gaze as your head is moving in space. And its real intention is to drive reflexes that allow your eyes to counter-rotate as your head rotates. So for example, I'm going to focus my attention and my gaze on the, little, on the camera, and then we'll rotate my head. That counter-rotation is extremely important. In the absence of that kind of counter-rotation and stabilization when, um, in response to even fast or slow movements, you would ha your visual world would be extremely blurry. This is a difficult figure for you to see because it's tilted, but you know, we'll take some time with it so that you can, um, you can tilt your head and adjust to it. So this, this gaze reflex, or the vestibular ocular reflex, is an extremely fast reflex. It, in effect, forms two to three synapses um, to send information to the, um, um, to the, mus uh, to the uh, ocular muscles. Okay. So in this diagram, the vestibular afferent neurons are encoded in blue. And they make a compulsory synapse in the uh, vestibular nucleus, in one of three vestibular nuclei, the superior, the medial, and the lateral uh, vestibular nucleus. There is an inferior vestibular nucleus that receives input to drive yet another reflex. This signal then is transmitted both uh, ipsilaterally and contralaterally. The first transmission is by, it, it goes to the trochle trochlear nucleus, then the ocular motor nucleus, 
from which it interfaces with the motor neurons that then drive uh, a set of six ocular muscles. A complementary signal is sent contralaterally to the other eye, because remember you need to be able to rotate your eye in a coordinated fat eyes in a coordinated fashion. The key to key point to recognize is that this very short projection pattern of three short um, uh, uh, the, this three neuron chain basically um, uh, allows this reflex to be extremely fast. So it's less than five milliseconds for the entire process to be complete. The vestibular system is also sending information to the autonomic system. For actually many of you who experience um, nausea um, in response to motion sick, I guess that's called motion sickness, um, you have experienced some sort of vestibular autonomic response. One of the main purposes of the vestibular autonomic reflexes is, for example, to maintain blood pressure in response to um, different positions. So certainly it's much harder to pump blood up to the brain if you're upright than uh, if you're tilted. So in fact, in this uh, example here, this is, the, um, this is the experiment that was performed in normal subjects and those with a lesioned vestibular periphery. None of these subjects had any visual cues because visual cues can help you compensate for vestibular dysfunction. So in this case, um, the subject was tilted. Uh, I guess it's a 60 degree nose tilt up and then uh, allowed to recover. And you can see that, in, that the recovery was much, um, that the um, change in blood pressure uh, resulting from the tilt was um, uh, much less dramatic in the subject with the normal vestibular system than in the one whose vestibular system was impaired. Finally, the vestibular system also, um, in addition to these two reflexes, there are vestibular spinal reflexes that contribute to our balance or postural control. So in this case, the vestibular nerve is making um, mandatory synapses in the uh, inferior nucleus, the lateral vestibular nucleus, and the medial vestibular nucleus. There are also projections that are going to the cerebellum, although we don't quite know what those, those are doing. Um, these neurons are then, um, uh, from, 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 these, um, from, from the vestibular nucleus, projections are sent to the motor neurons that control the neck muscles and to motor neurons that are controlling um, the spinal cord and the lower cervical part of the spinal cord. So this is an experiment that was conducted in, um, again, in a pa patients with a normally functioning vestibular system and in patients who had some sort of vestibular loss. Here, the experiment was uh, to place the patients on a moving platform that was tilting and to measure their, uh, the, their, their ability to compensate for that tilt by staying upright. Okay, so a person who is able to stay completely upright despite the movements of the, um, of the platform were, um, um, uh, was measured by how, 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 how much their body was swaying. So as you can see, in patients with vestibular dysfunction, that ability to compensate for movements was much more, they, they were unable to compensate for those, for those movements and there was much more sway to their body. Now, you should keep in mind that the vestibular system is important in driving these reflexes, but it actually is, is kind of a complementary system. So for example, in this experiment, you can also have proprioception, which can help compensate for body sway. If the subject has their eyes open and has a 
has some sort of a target upon which they can fix their gaze, once again, the visual system can help them compensate for any kind of a vestibular dysfunction. So the vestibular system, though important in maintaining balance and helping you reorient your eyes, also works in a multi-sensory way in such that you can help, some of these um, other senses can help compensate for vestibular dysfunction. And in the in-class session, I'll show you some interesting um, case studies in which uh, uh, under different circumstances, uh, people have compensated for a lack of vestibular system very nicely. Okay, so that's it for this introductory lecture. Um, the, the, the goal is, of course, for you to come to class and ask questions. I'm sure this is the first time we've done this, so there might be some gaps and I might have made some assumptions. So bear with me and we'll have some fun in class. Okay, bye-bye.